recently I contemplated training for another marathon. It's been a few years and I turn 40 next month. So I thought to myself, it's time. I need to prove to myself, middle age, that I can do this again. Then I stumbled upon an article entitled, 10 Reasons You Should Not Be Training for a Marathon Right Now. And it turns out I meet all 10 criteria. <clears throat> Although I'm not completely giving up, I just changed my goal to a much more realistic, shorter distance run. After all, I know myself all too well. If I don't have a goal, I simply don't exercise like I should. If I'm not intentional about some kind of specific end result, it's difficult to find the motivation to do much of anything at all. And I suspect I'm not alone. Of course, I'm not just talking about training for a race, but, but anything in life, really. A marriage, having a baby, school finals. Even those everyday things, like preparing emotionally to go visit someone in the hospital or rehearsing what you say in advance of that difficult conversation, or practicing hard on that new technique at work before actually executing it. Which makes perfectly good sense in theory, but not always so easy to live in reality. Or at least that's the case for my wife, Marion. For years, she's been telling me that she wants to play golf with me. If I would just buy her a set of golf clubs, so guess what she got for Christmas a couple of years? Since then, we've been to the driving range now once, <laughs> maybe twice. The first time she got so frustrated I thought she might not go again. The second time was a little better, but obviously not enough to encourage her to go back since. And so I asked her recently, why don't you want to go back out on the golf course? She said, because I want to hit it like those guys on TV. And I said, well, you know that requires practice. And she said, I don't want to practice. <laughs> I mean, it's the human condition, if you think about it. We have a hard time finding the motivation to get started. We look for the shortcuts and the, and the loopholes along the way. We want the feast without the fast. Which is particularly relevant to the season of Lent we began this last week on Ash Wednesday. I don't know about you, but I'm already struggling to keep my Lenten disciplines. Although I haven't quite gone to the lengths of one of my colleagues. A few, years, a few years ago, while serving as a college chaplain, she observed the ritual of serving tea and cakes after chapel whenever a student had a birthday. However, her own birthday fell right smack dab in the middle of Lent when several in the chapel group had given up chocolates and cakes. Anxious not to let her birthday go uncelebrated, one student volunteered a solution. You know how some people break their fast on saints' feast days, she said? Well, why don't we just find a saint whose feast day is on your birthday? And then we could have a cake and a clear conscience, too. Well, after reading our gospel again this week, I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if Jesus did not feel the same. It's a familiar story, one we read each year on this first Sunday of Lent. Jesus goes in the wilderness to fast, to pray, to be tempted for 40 days and for 40 nights. He's offered by the devil everything you and I could hope for in this life. The promise of never going hungry, absolute power and authority, and even eternal security and safety. And yet despite his hunger pains, his suffering, his humanity, Jesus resists them all as preparation or training, if you will, for his ministry to the world. But if you notice, at least according to Matthew, Jesus doesn't seem to recognize his need for this training. Matthew's version says that Jesus was led there by the Spirit. It doesn't say Jesus went on his own recognizing his need for this preparation. It doesn't say that Jesus of his own volition packed up and went into the desert to get ready for his earthly ministry. No, according to Matthew, Jesus, like us, does not seem to know fully what he needs. The Spirit shows him what he himself cannot see.
which is the way I felt on a trip to visit my mom in Indiana a couple of weeks ago. As many of you know, she's been very sick recently, in and out of the hospital some five times in the last three months. I'd not been able to see her since late fall, and so as soon as we rolled into town, I went straight to the hospital. Although I'd never been to this specific part of the hospital to which she'd been admitted, in fact, I entered the wrong wing and found myself wandering aimlessly when a nurse asked me if I knew where I was going. I admitted I had no idea. I proceeded to ask for directions. But rather than just pointing and telling me to follow the signs, instead she said, here, I'll, I'll lead you there. And I followed her through twisting, winding, unmarked corridors, literally one side of the hospital to the other until I reached my destination. She was with me every step of the way. No, that nurse didn't lead me into temptation, but she most certainly led me into the wilderness. Or at least that's what I found as I stood in the doorway of my mother's hospital room. And that's the difference, isn't it? God doesn't lead us to be tempted. But that doesn't mean that God does not lead us to places where temptation or struggle exists. In fact, Pope Francis felt it important enough to make this distinction as recently as a few years ago when he changed the language of the Lord's Prayer. In both English and Italian, the traditional version of the prayer petitions God to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Francis, though, says a loving divine parent would not impose temptation upon us mortals. A better translation of the original Greek would read, do not let us enter into temptation. The point being that God is not throwing banana peels in front of us to see if we'll slip and fall. But sometimes the Spirit does reveal to us what we'd rather not see. That circumstances are worse than we'd convinced ourselves they would be. That a need for change is more imminent than we had hoped. That we need more training than we'd like to actually admit. Or at least that's the purpose of Lent, isn't it? to come face to face with those realities we'd rather ignore in our lives, to acknowledge the brokenness that exists in each and every one of us that we'd rather not see, to recognize the ways in which our lives have become out of alignment with God. My friends in Kentucky would call this cattywampus, especially as it relates to those old barns that you see on the horizon as you drive across that state. While training for my last marathon, I, I used to admire those beautiful old structures. My longer distance runs through vast farmlands often brought me close and personal with them. The aged wood, the, vine, the way the vines and plant life grew in and out of them, how critters and creatures would make their homes in them. What I came to most appreciate about them, though, was their sheer resilience to withstand the elements over time. And the truth is, these are old, dilapidated, run-down structures, unsafe for any kind of real use except perhaps drying tobacco, and even that's perhaps questionable. In fact, there's a popular television show many of you, some of, some of you may have seen called Barnwood Builders. It's aimed at restoring these old barns. It features a crew of well-experienced craftsmen, their goal being to put new life into worn-out structures. If you watch the show enough, inevitably you'll hear one of the characters say, now this, this beam is just all cattywampus. Then he'll proceed to take out a chainsaw, shave a piece off, and suddenly the log snaps right into place the way it was intended to be. Which may, in the end, be not just a challenge, but the greatest temptation we face, we face not just on this first Sunday of Lent, but each and every day of our lives. The temptation to convince ourselves that we are not out of alignment with God. That a need for change doesn't even exist. Like those barns that pop up from the landscape, we become accustomed to the way things are. To our routines and our habits, to our old dilapidated souls, which is the reason we need something to lead us out and away from what's comfortable and regular and routine, so that we might notice where our lives may be falling apart in disrepair, or even be ready to collapse altogether, hurting ourselves and those around us. 
That's what today is all about. Taking that first step on this 40-day training away from those things that separate us from God and toward those things that draw us closer. Like acknowledging the forgiveness you need to give to that person who hurt you. Or accepting that you cannot change the situation that you're in because it's completely out of your hands. Or coming to terms with that anger you carry around you with you for one reason or another. The season of Lent leads us toward taking that first step and after that placing one foot in front of the other. Which I experienced in a way I had not before a few years ago at Tear Hospital in Houston, Texas. Tear is one of the top cognitive therapy hospitals in the country. People from all over the world who've experienced traumatic brain injuries, horrific accidents, go there for a second chance. And their stories literally line the walls. A young man in a coma for three months who's now back to surfing again. A man who can no longer walk but was recently elected to a judgeship. A congresswoman who was not expected to live but fully recovered. Not only came back to her position of public service but has continued to climb the political ladder. These stories surround the people who are recovering and serve as inspiration as they roll through and walk through these hallways from physical therapy sessions to rehab appointments. But Jerome, he couldn't see any of these pictures. He was blind and unable to walk on his own. I'm not sure what caused his accident, but it's obvious he had a long way to go at the time. I watched one afternoon as two physical therapists, one on either side of him, literally lifted his feet, placing one in front of the other as they were attempting to teach him to walk again. Of course, because he's blind, he cannot see where he's going, so another therapist strums a guitar and walks backward in front of him. Come on, Jerome. You can do it. Follow me. I'll lead you there. Believe it or not, I met Jerome on a Tuesday. It was Fat Tuesday, in fact. Ash Wednesday had yet to come. But for Jerome, Lent was already in full swing. Or at least he was experiencing a wilderness I could never even imagine. And while that therapist on the guitar wasn't singing, tune was so familiar. I can't be sure, but I'm almost positive he was playing that beloved hymn. He lives. In fact, now that I think about it, I'd stake my life on it.